All right, I'm pressing play. And this is the part where the room fills up or it doesn't fill up. And then we're like, oh, no. <laughs> no, people are coming. Yay. Okay. So um, if you are here because you are a fan of Rebecca Mahoney, who's just debuted her brand new book, The Valley and the Flood, um, then you're in the right place. Um, we will talk about this in a second. Um, and while we're waiting for the room to fill up, I am going to ask um, a weird quirky question because I love authors and I love quirky author questions. So um, a couple of weeks ago, we had Nicole L'Esperance. She was debuting her brand new YA book. And we talked a lot about tarot cards when doing um, plot development and character development. And I'm very curious to know if y'all use tarot cards or um, any other quirky things um, to get your inspiration for your writing. Do you want to go first, Nova? Um, sure, I will go first. Okay, so I love tarot cards um, and I use them for myself for like divination or like, you know, guidance. But in terms of writing, I would say the quirky thing that, that I have been doing lately during like this, the pandemic is I love to read short stories. And so what I'll do is I'll read like one short story in the morning and then there'll be a line from the short story that might jump out at me. And then I'll write that in my notebook and use that as like my inspiration for the day. Like my, like, you know, my guidance or my prompt for the day. And it could be just like any like random thing that, that, you know, inspires me. So you never know what it might be. And you never know, sometimes I don't know what story I'm going to read in the morning. So that's, that's a quirky little thing I do um, with, you know, the universe telling me a message. How about That's you, so Becky? Cool. That is so cool. Um, so yeah. I love tarot. <laughs> it really is. I love tarot. I'm very casual about it at this point in my life. But um, uh, this is actually making me think of, because uh, I usually get readings with one friend in particular, although um, she wasn't the one doing the reading that night. It was another roommate of ours. Um, and my question was, am I going to get published? This was back when I was in college. I don't remember what the past card was. I, I don't recall what the present card was, except that the image was several people toiling in like a desert wasteland. And then the future card was the sun. And she interpreted that as it's gonna be a very long road, but you're gonna get there. And uh, here I am 11 or 12 years after that reading with my first book. Wow. Oh, I can't wait to dive in more to that with our with our questions that we're gonna get to. <laughs> that is so interesting. I it's always so remember it. It, it was coming. It was. I, I when I was in the middle of it, I would think back on that reading and I'd be like, okay, I'm in the toiling in the desert wasteland part, but the sun is coming. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. That is the best. Oh, that is just the, I'm gonna cry. That was the best. <laughs> this is the best. You, friends, this is going to be the greatest hour, and I'm not going to be in the way of it very long. Um, but just as you can see, this is this is going to be the best. Um, so, hi, my name is Kira Wilson Cook. I am the events co coordinator, haha, -ha, for the Silver Unicorn Bookstore in Acton, Massachusetts. I am so delighted to be here with debut author Rebecca Mahoney, who is debuting her brand new book, The Valley and the Flood. And I hope we're going to talk about the gorgeous cover because it's just so gorgeous. It really, really is. I'm so excited. Um, today, Rebecca is here in conversation with veteran YA author Nova Rensuma, who is the author of her latest book is uh, A Room Away from the Wolves. I wish I had a copy of it in front of me, but it is available to you at The Silver Unicorn or at Silver Unicorn unicornbooks.com. She's also the co-editor of a new anthology, The Foreshadow. Yes, The Foreshadow Anthology, which I just think is a really great, I just think that's a great title. Um, this is going to be so much fun. Um, I just want to say, first of all, um, that all, both of these books, all of these books are available to you at the Silver Unicorn if you're local or silverunicornbooks.com or a local independent bookstore near you if you're far away. Um, you are invited to ask questions during this great conversation in the Q&A. I see that somebody already put something in there. Um, so if you have questions, then go ahead and do that. Um, and I think that's it. I always ramble for these things. So I'm going to disappear. Um, Rebecca, congratulations on your brand new book. Congratulations on finding the sun after toiling in the <laughs> deserts. Wow. <laughs> just, ah, that's the best story. Um, and I'm going to disappear until about 7.55. I'm telling you that this hour is going to fly. Um, and I can't wait to listen in. So enjoy. Congratulations. And see you in a bit. 
Thank you so much, Kira. Thank you, Kira. Um, so thank you to the Silver Unicorn Bookstore for hosting us tonight and to everyone who made the time to join us to help celebrate Becky's debut novel that came out last week on my birthday, actually. So I hope those of you who don't yet have a copy will um, grab um, a copy of this beautiful and haunting novel from hopefully Silver Unicorn Bookstore to support this wonderful independent bookstore and this debut author. So. I am Nova. I am thrilled to be here tonight to talk with Becky about her deliciously strange, wildly creative, and emotionally moving story. To those of you who don't know, Becky and I met at a ghost retreat. This is true. <laughs> um, this was a writing retreat that I co-led with a friend, Holly Hughes. We had 16 talented writers who were also fascinated with ghost stories, and we gathered together in the haunted city of Charleston, South Carolina. Um, so some of the, one of the things I remember about the retreat is that um, I had a hard time sleeping because I think the hotel was maybe haunted. But also, Becky, what I remember is when we first met, one of my favorite moments is we had our private conference. I don't know if you remember this. I do. And you told me the secret news that you had this novel coming out that no one, like it hadn't been announced yet. And then in the midst of the workshop, you were, you, you know, you shared it with, with everyone in the group. And I just, when you told me about this book, I just got a shiver and I knew that I that it, it was a book that I was going to love it would thrill me it would haunt me and that very much came true and I just love thinking of that moment and being here with you tonight. Thank you so much. Nova. So, um, so I am going to be asking Becky some questions and then of course I will turn to your questions so feel free to you know drop whatever you want to ask in the Q&A but to start us off Becky has chosen a passage from the book to read so we can all hear a taste of the story in her voice. I'm so excited to find out what part she picked. So mm -hmm. Becky, um, why, don't you, why don't you take it away? All right, thank you so much, Noah, for that beautiful introduction. I'm just so thrilled. Um, so I am gonna be reading you all a bit from the end of chapter four. So here's a, a quick summary of uh, what has brought my protagonist Rose to this point. While driving home, through the Mojave Desert from a disastrous visit with the parents of her late best friend, Gabby, Rose hears a broadcast that shouldn't exist. The last voicemail Gabby left her the night she died. When she follows that broadcast to the little town of Lotus Valley, Nevada, the situation only goes stranger. She meets a young woman who knows a strange amount of personal information about her and delivers a mysterious warning that she will find exactly what she's looking for. Rose also learns that the town does not have a working radio station. And while attempting to get her car fixed, she briefly sees a road, Sutton Avenue, that should be back in her hometown and not here in the middle of the desert. Now Rose has just been told by an intern in the sheriff's office that she has to meet with the sheriff of Lotus Valley the next day, and she's been left in the care of someone who came to find her at the station, the same young woman from earlier whose name is Cassie. And that's where we'll pick up. The bell rings as Cassie sweeps into the sweetest pie diner, and in one smooth motion, every head in the place pops up. There wasn't much conversation to begin with. As packed as it is, everyone in the place seems to be dining alone. But when I step past Cassie into their full view, the clinking forks stop. A few gazes widen as they sweep across me. This time I'm sure it's not my imagination. A waitress in a peach uniform eyes us from behind the counter. Cassie, she says slowly, it's okay. Cassie's own voice is firm and calm. We'll take a corner booth, please. Cassandra, a man in a tan suit stands up from his chair. My fingers twitch as it scrapes across the floor. You know better than anyone. I've made it very clear where I stand, Cassie chirps, but there's a chill in her voice. I'm sorry if that disappoints any of you. A mutter runs through the diner like a current. Four others stand from their tables, swinging their coats over their shoulders as they make for the door. Fellas, says the waitress flatly then freeze by the door, and then sheepishly dig wallets from their pockets and double back to the tables. Sorry, Adrian, one mutters as he passes. Who raised those boys? I don't know, Adrian says. Corner booth, you said? She leads us to, the table, to a table in the glow of a neon sign, which casts the menus in a shade of icy blue. I almost don't follow. Gabby wouldn't have followed. But Gabby also used to say I'd give up a kidney if it was the polite thing to do. And Gabby was, as usual, excruciatingly right. I slide into the vinyl bench with my back to the wall. The diner's long like a train car with one front entrance, one back. Not the worst odds if I can get to them. I settle out of sight of the other patrons. 
and slowly I hear the forks begin to clink again. Sorry. What can I get you? Adrian asked. The usual, please, with whipped cream and two cherries. Cassie turns to me. Do you want any pie? You have to try the blueberry mint, my treat. No, I say to my lap, thank you. Let's order a slice anyway, she says to Adrian. I'll eat it if she doesn't. With a curt nod, Adrian disappears toward the kitchen. As I glance up, Cassie flashes a thin smile. Now, why don't you start by telling me what you brought with you? What I, instinctively, I look over at my backpack on the bench next to me. You're looking at it. What followed you here then, she says, unfazed. Nothing, I say, I came here alone. You really didn't notice anything, she asks. Anything strange or different? Who was that kid back at the sheriff's office, I say, because you didn't bring me to him to talk about an appointment. Rose, Cassie says, it's not like I want to pressure you or anything, but I'd really appreciate it if you could focus. What is going on, I say. Why is everyone acting like they know what I'm doing here? Because we know what you're doing here. Cassie narrows her eyes. You're serious. You really didn't notice anything, did you? Now I'm the one who ignores the question. Who are you? Where did you hear the name Nick Lansbury? She opens her mouth to respond, but before she can get there, Adrian swings by with a strawberry milkshake and a slice of pie. Cassie looks away long enough to nod and smile, and as she pulls the glass toward herself, she slides the plate toward me. I think we might be talking past each other here, she says with a contrite smile. I don't return the gesture, but I nod. So why don't you answer a few of my questions first, she says, and then I'll tell you as much as I know. Why do you have to ask, I say. It seems like you know everything about me. No one knows everything about it. No one knows everything about anyone, she says with a dismissive wave of her hand. Now, you said your car broke down on the highway. You didn't wait with it. Why? I shrug as nonchalantly as I know how. I saw the blinking light on the broadcast tower. Figured they must be a town here to go with it. And that's why you want to go to the station so badly, she asked, stirring her milkshake. To thank it in person? I flush. Yeah, that's fair. I heard something on the radio, I say. A message no one but me should have. I'd like to know what it's doing on a station that closed up shop 50 years ago. If she has questions about that, she hides it well. She nods thoughtfully. And you're sure you came here alone? Of course I'm sure, I say. You saw me right after I got into town. She takes a long sip from her straw. And what is it you don't want to get worse? I'm sorry, I say. When I met you this morning, she says, you were worried that something was going to get worse. What exactly? What does that have to do with anything? She slides the straw out of her glass and runs it across her tongue. Curiosity. The weird thing is I want to tell her, just to see what it sounds like here in a place where it wouldn't change how everyone's already looking at me. My own parents don't know. It doesn't seem fair that some stranger should know first. Migraine, I say, had it since this morning. Is it my turn yet? By all means, Cassie says. But why don't I start by answering your other questions? I wait, but she doesn't speak at first. She twirls her straw. You asked about Alex Harper, she finally says. It's like I said, he's not from around here. His father brought him here when he was a very small, very ill child. He heard that the warm, dry air would help his lungs. He found a different kind of treatment. And I did bring you to him to book an appointment with the sheriff, by the way, she adds. He's a very good intern, very perceptive. He always knows exactly how urgent something's going to be. She starts looping one of her cherry stems into a knot. And as for who I am, she says, my name is Cassandra Cyrene and I'm the third most accurate prophet in Lotus Valley. Prophet, I'm not sure I should be laughing, but once I start, I can't stop. Okay, so you're psychic? People ask questions, I find them answers. She raises an eyebrow at me. May I ask what's so funny? There's, um, I say, my voice still shaking with laughter. Rankings? I miss second by that much too, Cassie says, holding her thumb and index finger centimeters apart not for John Jonas and that drought. I'm still smiling, even through the chill settling in my stomach. Teresa Gibson said that Cassie's recommendation was an honor. The waitress said Cassie's name like she was waiting for instructions. Don't sell yourself short, I say. That deputy did what you said without even asking. Oh, that, she says. That's not really because of me. That's because the prophecy that's about to come true is one of mine. The diner feels as if it's gone quieter than before. I lower my voice. How can you be so sure? Sounds like you've been wrong before. For the first time, she looks annoyed. If you're asking why I'm only third, it's because I miss the big picture from time to time. Sometimes I see so much that I make too many assumptions about what I didn't see, but I've never been wrong wrong. 
Now, would you like me to answer your question or would you like to be snide? It should be ridiculous, but I don't have Gabby here to tell me not to apologize. I sit back against the bench and I'm listening. As weak as the apology is, she seems satisfied. Have you lived near the desert long? My whole life, I say. So do you ever get the sense that you're not alone out here? Cassie asks. Is this really the first time you've heard something on these empty stretches of road that couldn't possibly exist? I'm not sure I understand, I say slowly. You're talking about, I'm talking about living things like you or me. Things living out of the corner of our eyes, flitting in and out of the gaps in time. Things that exist separate from us for the most part. She scrapes up the last drops of milkshake with her straw. I don't know that you can lump them all together. Some communicate, some don't. Some have shape, some look different from person to person, and some of them can't be seen at all except by the right people. Some of them want to be left alone, and some of them need us to survive for better or worse. They've only got one thing in common. When there's a shift in the world that can't be undone, from the greatest cataclysm to the smallest broken promise, that's one of them being born. Where you're from, you might call them a feeling in the air or an unexplained noise or someone walking across your grave. Here, we call them our neighbors. The oldest of them was born right here where this town was built, and now they're coming home. She levels her gaze across the table at me. I stare back blankly. Still didn't ring a bell? Then how about this? If you ask any person in this diner, they tell you that the most notable things about our town are as follows. The yearly quilting competition, the blue ray mint pie, and the massive flood that is set to wipe us off the map in three and a half days time. What do you know about that? I almost start laughing again, but she looks as serious as I've seen her so far. Three days, as in New Year's Day? I start to reach for my phone. But the weather says, I know what the weather says. She leans back. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Well, if it's not going to rain, then how? I have no idea how, Cassie says, but I think you do. What eventually comes out of my mouth isn't so much a laugh as a nervous giggle. How the hell would I know? Cassie's lips curve a little, and she makes a twirling motion with her finger. Turn around. I turn deliberately so she knows I'm humoring her. And behind her, as far as I can see, stretches the flat, burnt yellow grass of Sutton Avenue. I whip around to face front. Cassie's still there, pooled in the icy blue light of the sweetest pie diner. Behind me, I can hear mumbled orders, forks hitting plates, something sizzling from the kitchen. But when I venture another look over my shoulder, Sutton Avenue hasn't moved. It's not there. It can't be. But when I breathe in, my lungs fill up with cool, damp air that can't possibly exist. And my body starts to remember again, all on its own. Now, Cassie says, pushing the slice of pie onto my placemat. Let's talk about what followed you here. Oh, I am so happy that you, you read the part where the, the prophecy and the neighbors, which uh, my favorite. I love the neighbor. Okay, yay. yay. Um, so, so you touched on this. My first question is you touched on a little bit for those of us, for, for those who were here to hear us talk a little bit about the tarot cards at the beginning. And I, I always like to know how a published author got to this moment. Um, and I, I personally like it when it's not like a snap and an easy thing. Like it makes me want to root for the author more. It makes me want to like, it makes me love the book more. So, you know, publishing a book is not easy. The path is often convoluted and winding and long. And sometimes like in the valley and the flood, you may break down on the side of the road in the desert for a bit, <laughs> or you may end up in a place that you never expected. So Becky, I want to ask you about your journey as a writer. What led you to publishing your first book? What drew you to writing YA in particular? Well, before I launch into it, I just want to check. Are you getting any background noise from my end? Um, no. Okay. Uh, my if, roommate if other is people playing are, Uno upstairs. Okay. Yeah. If other people are like finding anything distracting, you can say something in the chat and let us know. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, where I started, let's see. Uh, well, I really started writing poetry very early on, uh, but I was involved in um, first a high school writing program and then college. And while I really wanted to write fiction, it turned out that I was much more drawn to novels than um, short stories. Short stories are definitely their own art form, as you know from your work in Foreshadow. Um, so the first manuscript that I wrote was senior year of high school. Um, I um, I think I started it as a NaNoWriMo, but um, I'm not a fast drafter. I've learned this about myself now. <laughs> um, 
So let's see. Um, I've done the math before and I need to count on my fingers every time. Uh, so if we're if that was the first complete manuscript, I had um, two incompletes in college that I won't count. Uh, one that I did senior year of college because um, uh, so I went to my university actually because they, because they had a thesis program where you could write a novel. Um, but college uh, writing programs tend to uh, not be terribly friendly towards genre work. So um, my application was rejected and they were like, well, I don't think you've really found your subject matter yet. You won't let me write it. But um, in any case, the um, book I wrote that year was the first one I queried to literary agents. Um, the book after that was the one that ended up uh, getting me signed with an agent. But then I um, sent, I believe, one, two, three um, books with that agent without getting a whole lot of interest. Um, and that particular agent um, moved to a different literary agency that required her to cut her list in half. And I was one of the ones cut. And that was in the first few chapters of Valley. Um, so I really sort of um, decided to say like, this has to be like, I have to be extremely me with this book because if it's not working anyway, I might as well do all of the things I wanted to do. Um, and that turned out working out pretty well for me. Um, and as for YAYA, -Y um, the sort of shift of your late teens, early twenties is sort of, um, a good setting for a lot of the things that interest me, like not just leaving your childhood behind, but you know, that feeling that you get at 17, 18, when you realize you never actually spent that much time acting like a child and suddenly like you're all, you're at the end of it. Um, and then most relevantly to Valley, um, it is also the time in your life when your brain chemistry starts to change. And I know that was true for me in high school. I start like, I didn't really recognize it until my twenties, but uh, my anxiety started developing when I was in high school. Um, and I think especially for um, teenagers who are a bit more interior, like how do you resettle back into a brain that you don't fully recognize? Uh, so those are a lot of the things I like to dig into with YA. Oh, yeah. And it's that the confusion of that, of not understanding and just being in the midst of it and that emotional moment of being a teenager. Yeah, I can absolutely see, you know, why that draws you and it comes out so, so beautifully in this book. Thank you. So, and, and also I, I love hearing your journey and, you know, where, where you ended up and that you put all of your, you know, yourself and was just entirely yourself in this book. And here we are. I feel like that's the magic answer for a lot of writers, you know, really. Okay. So um, inspiration, we get, <laughs> uh, we, we authors get inspiration from anywhere. And I always want to hear what lit the spark, you know, for an idea. What was the story behind the story or like the one thing that like, you know, suddenly you were like, oh, the valley and the flood, you know, like, I just, I just love to know that. So what were the first sparks of inspiration for the valley and the flood? Where did this idea really come from? So I feel like a couple things had to come together for Valley to sort of click as an organism. Um, and one of them, I um, don't know who's on the call right now, but some of you have probably heard me get on my horror soapbox before. So I apologize, I'm about to do it again. Uh, but sort of my theory of horror is that um, the resolution can work one of two ways. Uh, either the um, horror sort of acts as catharsis, like um, your external, taking the sphere, externalizing it, and then finding a way to metabolize it. Or um, it's sort of like kind of flipping a rock over, like it wants to unearth something and doesn't resolve that thing. It just wants you to sit with it. And that's really good for um, like horror movies that are sort of about this injustice that hasn't been resolved. Uh, but for the purposes of Valley, I wanted to sort of um, approach it from the horror as catharsis angle. So um, what the question was going into it is how do you externalize trauma? Um, and it started drifting in a slightly more surreal direction because trauma memories themselves are a bit surreal. Like um, I remember the first time that I had uh, what you could describe as a flashback, I was putting up a poster at work and 
suddenly like had this very sort of visceral sense of another time in my life um, that I was putting up a poster and it was just like the feel of my hand sort of um, smoothing something against the wall. So like this completely commonplace thing. And it even now it's like so hard to describe. It's like, I'm here, but I'm also there. Um, it's a weird sort of time slip. Um, and as I was trying to nail that down, I was actually talking to a friend who's a neuroscientist and he said, oh, trauma memories are actually encoded differently into the brain. Um, so regular memories are sort of narrative, like one thing after the other, but trauma memories tend to be encoded in this sort of like bullet time detail. Uh, like everything is very impressionistic, sensation-based um, and like, you don't really get the narrative of that day when you think back, but you get these incredibly sort of visceral moments um, because everything that wasn't relevant to your survival in that moment sort of got erased. Um, so through thinking about all that, sort of the flood as a character came together. Um, Lotus Valley itself was sort of slower to, um, sort of congeal into shape. Uh, but I had that nucleus of like Rose and the flood and the collision point I needed to get them to early on. And then when one day I was like, oh, and it's actually an Odyssey retelling too. I was like, okay, there, I know where to start. Oh, it's a very oh loose God. Odyssey retelling, but I was able to sort of use those beats to uh, figure out where I wanted to get Rose. It's so wonderful to hear all the different things that like lead to, you know, the congealing of the one idea. Oh, that is awesome. It was like over the course of a year. I think this was back in 2015. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, you mentioned Lotus Valley. So I wanna, I wanna ask you about that because, um, you know, writing a place like this, a place that comes to life and, you know, like memories come alive, the monsters inside us turn real, you know, there's a, you know, the great and terrible prophecy. I mean, so much is here in this, in this place. And also, you know, it, like it just, it's all encompassing. I would love to know, like you said it was maybe slower to come, but like, how did you end up bringing the place to life and writing it so, you know, so wonderfully on the page. Um, so the interesting thing was at the time I wrote the initial draft of Valley, I had not been to the desert yet, like at all in my life. Um, so I, I went a bit later to, uh, I had a wonderful writing retreat through Futurescapes in Capitol Reef National Park, Utah. Mm -hmm. And I got to see the sky and feel the altitude sickness and the amazing yeah. amounts of water I had to drink. And it was one of the best weekends of my life. Um, but the way that Val uh, Lotus Valley came together um, was through sort of my uh, lifelong love of liminal spaces. Mm -hmm. Like my family moved across the country. This was uh, up and down the East Coast, New Hampshire, Florida, when I was a kid. And those roadside towns that could kind of like reappear and disappear, depending on the way you were looking at them, really fascinated me uh, and really stuck in my mind. And um, in particular, when I was drafting Valley, um, I spent a lot of time sort of, because I um I work in colleges for my day job. So over the summers, I would sort of um, go on long walks during my lunch break and go through the empty classroom buildings. And I it really helped to sort of look at these empty spaces that should have been full to get into the Lotus Valley mood. Um, so that's at least how I got the setting and the vibe. Um, but the characters of Lotus Valley sort of developed in future drafts as I was um, figuring out exactly who the neighbors were going to be. And usually, um, as I was, um, sort of populating the town, the neighbors came first. Uh, and then I would sort of figure out who the humans were as a reflection of those neighbors. Although, um, the, uh, pro the prophet John Jonas, who uh, is Cassie's rival, uh, came about because um, I like to joke that I have the least exciting um, prophecy, of prophecy ever because I will dream about things like the milk going bad and then the next day the milk has gone bad. So uh, I was like, what if there was a prophet who was really accurate, but all of his predictions were super small? 
That's awesome. That's just awesome. I love knowing that the neighbors, you know, came first for anyone who's read this book and that you found the people who they belong to, you know, after that. What an interesting writing, you know, exercise. Like create a monster. Who is the who is the character that this like I mean, I'm I'm inspired. You've inspired me. Oh, yay. <laughs> so, so um, you know, you talked about about you know your inspiration for writing um, about trauma. And you do it so beautifully, so delicately, as Rose faces her PTSD and memories that reveal events of her past, and you know, really coming to terms with, you know, what what has happened, what she needs to face, and and healing in the end, you know, true healing. I'm not going to give anything away, but um, so what you know, did you do any more um, research as you were working through this? Is there is there more that went into this that was personal for this the writing this trauma? You know, it's a it's a heavy thing to to carry in a book, and I think you handled it so gorgeously. Thank you, appreciate that, and um, that was definitely one of the things that sort of kept me up the most at night when I was writing the book because it is the most personal thing I've ever written, um, which was both sort of, um, it was, you know, very cathartic for me to write the book, but then after the fact, it was also very scary, like, well, what makes me an expert? Um, because grief and trauma are like some of the most universal things that you can find, but they're so different from person to person. Um, and, you know, sometimes the jagged edges of our grief don't quite match up with the jagged edges of another person's grief. I know there are things that uh, I read when I was having a hard time that did what they went out to do perfectly effectively, but just like um, didn't quite mesh for me. And I'm sure that um, Valley is going to be that for someone else. And I just like wanting to be a book that sort of made everybody feel the way that it made me feel was a yes. like a little scary just knowing that it was impossible uh so what i had to decide was i needed to make this the story that i would have needed and i was going to do that as sensitively and gently as humanly possible um so i had other readers i um had a um, teen psychologist that Penguin Random House actually arranged to read it, uh, look over the manuscript. And uh, my own lovely therapist was subject to a lot of Q&A from me over uh, doing certain things sensitively and responsibly. So it was both um, sort of an exorcism and a lot of uh, thought and research that actually uh, changed my perspective on my own brain a few times. That is so, that's so helpful for people to know, I think, in writing, you know, taking on heavy subject matter, something serious, especially for young readers, for our audience of young readers, and what goes into that behind the scenes, you know, what, you know, who you might get help from, who you might, you know, be asking for, you know, to give a read and, and what your publisher might expect of you, you know, I think that's really, really wonderful that, you know, you did that so, you know, respectfully and carefully. So, um, so I want to talk about the process of, of, of writing the book uh, in terms of plotting, because this is not a straightforward retelling. And how could it be with memories coming in and, you know, things, you know, not, full, not fully emerging until later in the story? How could it be? Right. right. So how did you how did you, you know, plot work on the plot of the story? Like, do, are you an outliner? Did you have like pictures on the walls? Like, do you have any any secrets that you might offer us for those of us who are writers here in the audience? I am absolutely an outliner. Um, so I, I usually give myself like the first three chapters or so to settle into a world. And then I want to know where, where I'm going because I like to set certain things up fairly early. Um, so um, the way that Valley ended up being a bit different um, from my other manuscripts up to this point is I am a chronic underwriter, like that was consistent. Um, but maybe what changed was that I um, work with uh, people, I worked with people on this one, Hannah Ferguson, my agent, and Alex Sanchez, my editor, who really got what I was going for and really wanted to tease it out a lot more. So mm -hmm. I feel like Valley kind of came together in a spiral. And the nucleus, as I said, I, that I had was um, Rose and the Flood and the way they were going to collide. So I think the first thing that I planned out um, 
sort of to the minute was the sequence of Rose's flashbacks, although um, I did add a few here and there. Um, and there were certain elements that I had um, in the original draft, but when I signed with Hannah as my agent, um, she said that we really needed to expand Lotus Valley. And the way that we were going to do that was essentially to rewrite the entire middle. So the, pl um, the mayor is a character and the um, sort of entire um, plot in Lotus Valley where um, they've got sort of this charter um, that they will take in any sort of comers as long as they tow a certain line. Um, so the sort of like dark parks and rec, I guess, uh, a plot line going on there was added down the line. Um, but I think that it was really helpful uh, in particular to sort of build those stakes in Lotus Valley because it helped me really f flesh out Lotus Valley, sort of thinking about, um, I guess, realistically, how a town would be divided on um, sort of hosting these eldritch beings as their neighbors and, you know, you know, would uh, certain people, of course, would be extremely okay with it. Certain people, even though this town exists because of these beings, uh, would be like, well, it's ours now, so we have to make it as normal as possible. Um, so I think that was the last layer, but it also really pulled everything together because um, I was able to sort of tie those in with um, Rose's fear of both the flood and of her own trauma um, sort of lining up with the townspeople rejecting their own strangeness, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so it really helped me externalize that conflict in a couple different ways. So it's so oh, fascinating. Sorry. Oh, I've, I feel like I'm echoing for a second. Oh, I, I am not echoing anymore. <laughs> Who knows? It's like some sort of haunting going on in the, <laughs> in the Zoom room. Um, you know, I, I too, um, my first YA novel had to had to basically throw out 200 pages of the middle of, of, of the book um, because my editor wanted me to rewrite the middle. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes you have a very clear image of, you know, the openings and, and then the end and the middle pieces need to be reimagined. Restitched. <laughs> Restitched. <laughs> yeah. So um, writers often have a favorite moment or a favorite element in their own books. And it's often something I think that the, re the readers might not guess, you know? So for me, as you think of yours, um, in my most recent book, A Room Away from the Wolves, my favorite moment was actually the, the very end, the second to last chapter, which was just like a, a mother-daughter um, you know, chapter between the, the mother and the daughter. And it wasn't something I had planned. I was surprised when I wrote it and it became like my favorite part of the whole book. And I think it's actually the reason I wrote the book. Like it was like everything like came out in this, it's like maybe five pages, like, but there's something there and it became like my favorite thing. So um, in the Valley and the Flood, do you have a favorite moment or a favorite element or something from your book that maybe readers might not know? Ooh, I do. Um, so there's um, a series of, so the way I actually do Rose's um, flashbacks through um, viewing her memories through the flood, because the flood communicates through human memories, is uh, the flashbacks are written in second person, which is a series of Rose writing these notes to herself. And that actually came from the way that I journaled, which um, was always really helpful to me. Like it, like even if my sound day board was my Myself. I felt like I had a sounding board. Um, so my favorite part, and I won't spoil it, is Rose's final note to self, which closes out the book. And actually the last paragraph of it is was sort of like my calm down mantra for myself on uh, a really anxious time. So um, I guess I wanted to sort of immortalize that in the book. Oh. I, I love knowing that. I think we're all going to be turning to that, you know, after this and, and be like, you know, to, to, you know, it's always so interesting to feel, to find out what really is so meaningful for the writer themselves, you know, that isn't always as obvious. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple more questions and then we can turn to audience questions. So if you have any, please put them in that Q&A box and I'll see them there. Um, so I wanted to ask about, you know, your influences. What books, movies, or other media inspires you for your stories? You know, what and who are your influences? Oh, man. Well, it's probably 
pretty obvious that I love a um, weird small town. Um, I think a lot of podcast listeners will recognize the Welcome to Night Vale influence in the book, uh, but also um, I was really, I've been really inspired by Twin Peaks. Um, way, way back in the day, I think I got hooked on weirdness through um, Louis Sacker's Wayside School Books, which are just the pinnacle. Um, but there's also one that I wanted to mention because it really defined how I think of monsters. And it's a, a Japanese anime called Mushishi. And it's sort of this beautiful slice of life um, series set in this indeterminate period of time where there are these things that are kind of like a mix of monster, parasite, and insect. And they sort of affect these characters' lives through supernatural ways and sometimes like even cause harm, but the harm is never intended. And these beings are sort of depicted as these forces of nature that don't have morality that aligns with people. Like they just are as they are. And that just like, it really made me rethink monsters. And in particular, it made me rethink it for this book where I wanted these characters to sort of communicate in a way that people could understand but even though these things might be terrifying and might even cause you harm like they don't mean harm they're just trying to live <laughs> I, I love that actually I was really hoping that you would say Twin Peaks because <laughs> I noticed I noticed that like this comes up when people talk about this book like they bring up Twin Peaks I have like such a I you know, I, I I won't go into what I thought of the most recent reboot of Twin Peaks, but like, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it certainly influenced me as a writer as well. And I oh, think, yeah. you know, it's so interesting how, you know, something that's not our form that we, you know, our, our art that we do, you know, we're, we're not television writers where, you know, maybe, maybe we are, but you know, in terms of like, you know, how something else can like find its way kind of like sidle in and um, inspire you in different ways. I love, I love knowing that. Oh, it's so, so true. Um, so I want to, you know, not to, not not meant as a downer, but this past year has been, um, you know, nothing like no one ha could have expected, right? You know, with the pandemic, mm -hmm. with you know quarantines, with with so much else going on, but we still have to find creative ways to get ourselves through, you know, this moment and you know through this this past year and i was wondering you know what have you done you know in this past year for for your creativity for your writing or for you know to just keep yourself in a in a positive creative place any creative kickstarts or or tips Ooh. to share with us oh man it's been hard um thankfully i am not somebody who um is particularly drawn to write in a coffee shop uh because i can't do the chaos but yeah. I never realized how much a change of scenery was sort of vital to my creative process. Um, Cause just like being in the house all day and I work, um, essentially my choices are here where I'm sitting on this couch or up in my bedroom. Um, and having the most I see in my life just be my bedroom, the stairs and the living room was really sort of my brain felt extremely sludgy. Um, so first just being able to get out, see different things, exercise. Um, I got one of those, um, pressure point tools that sort of curve like an S, um, for some of the aches I had for my non-optimized workspace from home. And I swear I felt blood flow to my brain for the first time in like five months. So stretching, very important to stay creative, um, and just keep reading like, um, I've, uh, I have a pile of friend books uh, that I'm going to dive into in the next few weeks now that I'm not overcome with launch panic. Um, and just that exchange of ideas uh, really keeps my creativity going, especially if you have a good group chat of fellow creative people that you can bounce off of, like that um, improv nature of it, especially really um, keeps it fresh and keeps me thinking about um what I want to be doing next oh, that's so good to have that kind of you know connection and just like find a way find a way through this we all you know we all are, are seeking trying to figure that out you know, you know? In, this, in this space and I have to say too with the with the pandemic I was surprised to discover that it really ignited something in me in terms of my reading like I feel like I'm reading more than ever before 
um, it, it almost like saved me from, you know. Oh, that's great. The, 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 the weird, you know, loneliness and everything being canceled and right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So exactly. you know, we, all, we have books, we have books. So um, last question before I um, turn to this Q&A box. So if anyone has a, a question for us, please put it there. Um, I want to make sure that we know what's coming next from you. Mm -hmm. And all, you know, to those of us who love this book and to those of us who haven't yet read, read it and will read it and then immediately will be like, okay, what's next? Um, and also, you know, look where else we can find you. You mentioned the, the podcast. So what are you working on now and where else can we find your work? All right. Well, um, I am working on something top secret now, but uh, it's a lot of fun. It's also YA uh, set in a small town, in a very different part of America. And um, it gets me a little closer to my horror roots and then to the sort of surreal fantasy that Valley has been. So that's been fun. I'm making it as creepy as possible. And hopefully I will have more to share of that book um, in the coming weeks, months, et cetera, depending on how publishing moves these days. Um, and yes, you can find um, more of my work through the Bridge podcast. That's um, a, a podcast I co-created and co-write with Alex Brown. Uh, we are on hiatus at the moment, thanks to um, various life changes for both of us, but we've got a good 15, 16 episodes out and we're hoping to close out the season um, sometime in the coming year. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, let's see what we have here. We have um, we have a yay for tarot cards <laughs> in the in this in this Q and A. So um, you know we talked about this at the beginning in terms of tarot cards, and you know you you mentioned uh, hopefully people have heard about the the reading that led you to know you know that there was the sun in your future and that this was coming. But do you do you use tarot cards at all for for writing? So I you actually, um, the um, Nicole Lesperance talked about this at her uh, launch with the Silver Unicorn, I believe it was two weeks ago, but I've actually never used uh, tarot cards in writing before, and that is something I'd absolutely like to try. Um, I think the archetypes with some of those cards are really interesting, um, and I, um, I tend to do the fairly old-fashioned, like, character sheets when I'm creating a protagonist, but doing a reading for a new protagonist is an interesting way to get ideas for uh, where they're going. That said, I can't actually do readings without a very detailed guide in front of me, so I will probably um, consult a few experts with that. Yeah, and maybe like even dipping in and just like, you know, finding a card and seeing like, okay, where is this taking me in terms of my plot? <laughs> right. <laughs> you never know, you never know. Um, okay. So um, another question here, this is from Kip Wilson. Congratulations, oh, Becky. Kip. So excited for you and so nice to see you in Nova. Hi, Kip. <laughs> My question <laughs> is, is, is this more of a daytime read for a scaredy cat me? Eek. So do you consider your book scary? Um, I have been told that my barometer is flawed. Um, so I would say, I don't think it's that scary. It's a little creepy in places. Uh, but my boss already yelled at me this week for uh, ruining um, quiet movie theaters for her. So it's probably a daytime read. So, so you're, so you like, you didn't put too much scary things in, in this book, but you're saving them perhaps for, for what's coming next. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You couldn't contain yourself and you had to like touch on that. You gotta <laughs> add a little for spice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Okay. This question is from Nicole De Janeiro, who, yes, we, we have a ghost connection. Ghost so um, which neighbor in Lotus Valley is your favorite one? Oh my gosh. Well, um, I uh, do have a deeply soft spot for the flood who was very misunderstood cataclysmic individual, but my favorite is always going to be Rudy. So Rudy is um, the neighbor who is uh, sort of attached to the sheriff's shadow and he uh, has innumerable arms. He is very protective of uh, the sheriff and of the town, uh, but he's got a big soft spot um, and a uh, voracious appetite, which can be turned anywhere from uh, French fries to uh, another neighbor acting out. So uh, I really enjoyed writing 
uh, all of his little quirks and sort of uh, he's like almost an antagonistic force because you know he uh, if Rose can't get the flood under control he is going to uh, really mess stuff up but he is also adorable and I want one of my own. <laughs> yeah. So when you, you you said you wrote those neighbors first so you did you did Rudy get you know created first and then you discovered oh maybe this should belong to this person is, is that oh, one yeah. of the ones yeah I think Christy was um maybe the only character who came before her neighbor um because she was in one of the very earliest concepts because I had all of these various beats from the Odyssey and she's sort of been my Athena character from the start uh so I I designed Rudy for her more than the other way around, uh, which was different from the others, but um, they became quite an inseparable pair in my mind. Have you ever thought like for yourself, like if you would have had a neighbor, <laughs> like, I just, I'm really fascinated with the neighbor thing. Oh, have man. you ever thought about that, about like what, what form it would take or what like, you know, interesting oh, forms man. it might have? <laughs> That's a good question. I think like um, as, somebody with anxiety i would have this sort of like ghoul that like lives in the basement and you might feel the chill when it's coming upstairs uh but as somebody who tries to sort of make peace with my anxiety these days i try to be like oh hey buddy <laughs> <laughs> watching some netflix you in right 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 <laughs> yeah. okay um just a couple more comments from katherine welsh um, just saying about the scared about if the book is scary um saying i am a scaredy cat and was not scared if that helps so i i agree there for you anyone, go for anyone who wants to read this book it it's emotional and, and and beautiful through memories and strange and you know i think that there are there's a character facing fear but i wouldn't call it something that is like a, a scary thing that people who would you know that would turn them off should, would turn away from so don't worry about that this is absolutely a book that is not i don't think going to you know give you nightmares in the way that you know you're imagining for a horror book but maybe the next book that Becky exactly. writes will do that <laughs> yeah. I was, yeah. yeah i would say valley is much more eerie than scary um <laughs> eerie yes and i love that eerie it, it it speaks to the mood and the atmosphere and just like what runs through you know everything um okay and what another comment from maddie franklin not a question just congratulations thank you maddie, Hi, maddie. okay um and then here um shelly cornelison congratulations becky hi nova hi we got a um, big ghost turnout today. <laughs> I know. So <laughs> many authors have a brand, but it often gets categorized as genre. What more personal or defined thing would you use to define your writing brand if you believe you have one? Ooh, Ooh. What a great question, Shelley. That's a great question. About. Yeah. Oh, that's a very good question. I think what I would love for my brand to be is sort of like the thing that I love most, which is writing sort of emotion through speculative fiction because I think like some like something horrifying or fantastical is sort of one of one of the most interesting ways for me at least to tease that out sort of like make that emotion as sort of epic and sweeping and terrifying on page as it feels sort of in your body mm -hmm. um and catharsis is probably also what I would like to be my brand because no matter how uh, much I put you through in terms of the story I would like my narratives sort of in the end to be really gentle and really forgiving towards both its characters and its readers oh I think you really accomplished that with this book and I feel I feel like I can see that you can you can come to that from different angles that's a really really good question I think for all of us you know who are here who as writers to think about like what makes a book my, me even if it's different you know even if it's different what's that thread that current okay we have um, a question here from Alex Brown. Hi, Alex. Hey, Becky and Nova. Love you both. We love you too. <laughs> um, if you could write a story based on an existing horror property, franchise or standalone, what would it be? Oh my gosh, that's a very good question. Um, 
so what I think I've talked a bit about about this in the past, uh, actually two that I've talked about in the past. One, I would love to write um, a modern riff on Dracula where Lucy Weston Ra is the protagonist. Um, sort of like something with her having to um, fight Dracula's thrall and sort of be able to do that because she's a character that's sort of a footnote in Dracula. And I would sort of, it would be a really interesting narrative to have a character sort of uh, fight a vampire's influence as it's sort of closing in on her. But also I would love to write uh, a Clarice Starling YA. Oh my God, okay. Okay, <laughs> wow. I was just reading an interview about, you know, about the Silence of the Lambs from like years later. Oh, I want you to write both of those. And I see there's a comment here, Nicole, Nicola saying, please make the book happen, the, Dra the Dracula book. I agree. I feel like for those of us here in the, our, this room who heard this, we'll just, let's just keep it. Let's just keep it quiet. <laughs> let's just remember that Becky has this idea. Becky, you should, you should think about that one. Yeah. I've got a few I've got a few pages of it actually. <laughs> Do you? Oh my god. Do. Oh, I love that. I love Keep your that. fingers crossed for me. <laughs> okay. I I I think we're done with our um, audience questions. I don't know if um if if yes. Hi, Kira is hey, back. Kira. Hello. I told you that the hour was gonna fly. Like I told you. <laughs> I know, right? And I know. It totally did. And then we got to that last question, and I feel like the whole room just did like a. <gasps> I know. Like, that was really. That was a really big deal. Yeah. So um, this was kind of the best. This this was kind of the best. Like That's the energy was here. awesome. This was just. This was so phenomenal. Um, I I, I don't want to break this up, but uh, it is. It's the end of this hour. Um. Are, are, do you just have any other just like final thoughts for this audience who's been here and has been cheering you on and is just so excited for you in this book? Oh man, well, I adore you guys. Thank you so much for coming out tonight, so to speak. And I hope that um, the next time we do this is in person. Uh, and also um, I think some of you have your books already, but I will be sending some book plates to um, Silver Unicorn, uh, if you're going to be purchasing through them and they're gorgeous. Uh, I had a friend do art based on the cut. Oh, I should shout out the cover, which everybody uh, rightfully yes, recognizes. Yeah. Uh, so the cover art is by Matt Saunders and the design is by Maggie Edkins and they just like absolutely blew everybody's minds. Um, and the uh, the book plates are by a friend of mine, uh, but they it's sort of a, a her take on the cover and they're absolutely beautiful. I should have brought one down here to show you, but they will be at the Silver Unicorn. <laughs> It'll be an extra surprise. Exactly. Um, so if you are uh, in the audience and you would like one of our exclusive, uh, oh, I mean, they're not exclusive, but if you want one of the pretty book plates, um, then go to silverunicornbooks.com and then in the comments, right i would like a book plate please um and we will make sure that you get one it might it might take a minute because i'm not sure if we've got them yet um yeah maybe paul can throw that house. in the chat okay brilliant so <laughs> we don't have them yet but we will get them so it, it might add a slight delay but it'll totally be worth it so mm -hmm. that. they're um, absolutely stunning nova you are an amazing uh, you're an amazing host I, I you know you should do this all the time <laughs> I feel like we should have you back <laughs> you I love I love asking writers questions <laughs> like I you're just so I'm so I'm so interested in just like what's behind the scenes of the book you know what I mean it's Gosh. just and I love knowing what went into a, a writer's journey so I really loved hearing you know like Becky's behind the scenes pieces about this book it makes it even more special so they were fantastic question. Thank you for so much for taking the time. It was it was an honor. Yeah. <laughs> this was the best, y'all. Thank you, just thank you so much, and thank you to this wonderful audience with your questions too. Um, everyone, this book is beautiful and totally worth your time. And I hear maybe not might not be as scary as we all think. I'm also a scary cat. We'll see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're looking forward to your next projects, Becky. I hope that you will come back. Of course. Um, and Nova, I hope that you will come back. Um, this was just phenomenal. Um, everyone, pick up this book. Come see us if you're local. Um, come see us on silverunicornbooks.com if you're not. Or if you don't want to get it from us, please find a local independent bookstore near you to pick up this book and uh, you know all your other books. 
Um, we love you and we want to see you soon. All right. So stay safe out there, stay healthy. Um, and yes, hopefully we will see you all in person very soon. Have a wonderful evening, y'all. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye.